The content that we see in this epistle, I'm telling you right now, there's an urgency. There's a message that Jude is delivering that if, if, if I didn't know better, he had written yesterday. But he actually wrote this almost 2,000 years ago, over 1,900 years ago. Now that's really something. There's, there's things in this epistle that are a profound wisdom that we need to glean from. And I'm gonna tell you there are warnings that we need to heed right now. Beginning with the date written, when was this written? The scholars say it was you know, written somewhere between 60 and 80, 80 AD. I, I'm gonna close that gap for you. I am of a very strong opinion for many reasons why it was written probably between about 60 or even 62 to 68. That's when this thing was written. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I believe that. Uh, number one, what happened in 70 AD? Right in the middle here, we know it's the destruction of Jerusalem. Absolutely one of the most monumental things that has ever happened in the history of the world, let alone the history of Israel. All you need to do is go through and read the book of Jude, read what he is writing, the content, and you will quickly see there is no way Jude wrote this post-destruction of Jerusalem. He would have absolutely mentioned it. No, this is not even debatable because he has the opportunity. This is the vein he's going in. He certainly would have took the time to talk about the most influential thing his eyes would have ever seen other than Yeshua himself coming. The other thing that I think is critically important is that 2 Peter was written, they estimate, anywhere from about 62, 63 to 68 AD. What does that matter? 2 Peter is a companion to the epistle of Jude. And this is very important because one of the things that you're going to notice that we do throughout this series is we're going to be drawing from 2 Peter. And the reason is, is Peter gives the exact same sermon that Jude gives. In fact, you'll find scholars debating, maybe that's too strong of a term, discussing who came first, who's copying who. Was Peter looking to Jude's epistle and saying, man, that is a phenomenal message. That, that is the message we need to hear today. I'm going to take that and I'm going to go. And he drafts Second Peter. Or was it Jude looking at Peter and saying, that's a powerful message. You know what? I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it. I mean, this is the discussion because it's that uncanny. These, they're, they're parallel. They're companion documents. In addition to that, we think about when the date is written, I always want historical context. As much as possible, we need to touch and, and taste and smell what was going on at that time. You know, if you remember our Hebrew series, this is one of the things we covered, we looked at, and, and Hebrews was written around the same time that the epistle Jude was. What was going on at that time? Well, I can tell you this. Number one, Jews were coming into the faith of the Messiah Yeshua. And guess what? They were being thrown out of the synagogues they grew up in. The synagogues that their family attended every Shabbat, they're now being cast out as evildoers. This is happening. At the same time, Gentiles all over the world are flooding in to the faith. I mean, you want to talk about turning your entire world upside down? We're at this moment, the first century, everything was rocked to the core. But then you have something else that happened. You don't just have the rabbis persecuting the Messianic Jews. Now you have, for the first time in Christian's history, which wasn't that long, the first time you have officially the government starting to rise against her. And isn't it interesting? How does it start? It starts with the rumblings. It starts with a campaign of propaganda. It starts when you start to see the government becoming more and more intolerant towards your beliefs. Let me ask you something. Does that sound familiar? Because you need, to, you need to look at what is going on in this country right now with the government and what is being said and their thoughts on Judeo-Christianity, what they really think of it. It is eerily reminiscent of where Rome was at before 64 AD. And then when 64 AD comes, man, something happens. It hits a crescendo. 
You had the great fire of Rome. Oh, and then at that time, because we had this catastrophe, now it's the Christians' fault. And they began to burn them at the stake, literally lighting the night up, burning Christians alive. It was, it was mounting. It was growing more and more intolerant until they had that opportunity to put all that on them. I'm going to tell you right now, this epistle, its historical context, every aspect of about it, relevant for today. Let's move on to the author. Who is the author? Well, it's pretty simple. We know right off the bat, it is Jude. Or in the Greek, Eudas. This is important. Eudas, or as, as you would say, there's different ways we translate it. Uh, Judas or Judah, right? And so Jude is this author. But fortunately, because, you know, this name was extremely, Eudas was extremely common. Judah, Judas, extremely common name in the first century. That doesn't exactly narrow it down. The writer knows this. And what's he do? He goes on and says, I'm a bondservant of the Messiah Yeshua. Oh, and I am a brother of James. I'm a brother of James. Who's he talking about? Because he's assuming his audience knows exactly who he's talking about. I mean, this is a, this is a heavy hitter. This Yaakov, well, when you actually know who he's talking about, he is the prince, the Nasi of the court, the court that Yeshua himself seated to take possession of Jerusalem to be the highest governing law in the world. It's the apostolic court. And James is the one that you read about in Acts 15, who actually he himself is the one who renders the verdict. When that, cons- when that total controversy broke out in regard to what do we do with these Gentiles who are coming in? They're uncircumcised. What are we going to do with them? You know, some of the believing Pharisees said, no, they have to be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas rise up and say, no, Peter rises up, give his testimony. He says, no. And it is James that renders the verdict. This guy is the, probably the most influential, most well-known believer Uh, on the face of the planet at the time. All the plot thickens when you actually take it a step further and you realize who James is beyond that because guess what? This James the just, as they call, he was the literal biological brother of Yeshua. Follow that to its logical conclusion because if that is the case, then who is Jude? He's the biological brother to Yeshua. This is, this is the guy that we're about to step into his book. Now, it's interesting we re, what's recorded in Matthew 13. A list of Yeshua's brothers are given. We read this. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James? Joseph or Yosef, Simon? Oh, Eudas. Now, here, you wouldn't typically connect the dots if you're just reading your Bible in the English because we just read Jude 1.1 and it said Jude. He's the guy, but you'll notice here they translated Judas, but know this, when you go to the Greek, it's the exact same name. We just called Jude, Jude, in the book of Jude, so as to kind of separate it, if you will. And I guess everyone else is called Judas, or Judas, or Judah. You got it? And so here we see, man, this guy that we're coming into, this is awesome. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor, hit the like button, don't forget to hit the share, and if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you wanna watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you wanna watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your Play Stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.